Today we will end our first section on the um, three-level construction of effective field series and begin with the second section on loop calculations. Here is a summary of what we did and what we have observed so far. Namely, if we have a fundamental theory which contains heavy particles and light particles, then the heavy particles can be integrated out of the theory and at the end of the section we understood what that means, namely we can literally take the path integral, which is an integral over all field configurations of the heavy and light fields. We integrate over the heavy fields, receive a path integral only over light fields and this is the effective field theory which depends only on light degrees of freedom, but nevertheless describes the physics of those light degrees of freedom correctly in an expansion of uh, ratios of the light energy scale divided by the heavy masses. So we have seen in this way that such low energy effective field theories exist and we have constructed them in two ways, namely by integrating out and on the other hand by directly matching Feynman diagrams of an ansatz for an EFT to the Feynman diagrams of the full theory. The EFT has properties that we have discussed and listed. Uh, the Lagrangian is local. It is a local quantum field theory, but it is non-renormalizable. Nevertheless, it has predictive power by virtue of power counting rules, which we have seen in our examples and which we will come back to in more generality later. So um, in the EFT, there is yet another uh, property which is not so well known from uh, renormalizable quantum field theories, namely there are ambiguities in the Lagrangian for the description of physics. Um, and we have um, analyzed this ambiguity in great detail in one example of the exercise, which means that we can change the Lagrangian by using field transformations which are or can be nonlinear in general. So, and that can be used in practice, of course, to optimize the Lagrangian to make it as simple as possible without changing the physics content. So there are many applications of effective field theories and in this uh, semester we will study quite a few interesting applications, I hope. But uh, just as two directions, uh, you should have in mind that uh, one can use effective field theory techniques like these ones if the fundamental theory is known. That was the case so far. Uh, we could explicitly construct the EFT to match the physics description of the fundamental theory. And in this way, the effective field theory becomes a calculational device, a tool which allows us to describe low energy physics accurately, but maybe technically more efficiently than we could by using the fundamental theory. Since obviously the EFT contains only the relevant degrees of freedom, the irrelevant degrees of freedom have been eliminated from the theory, which makes the calculations more straightforward and allows us to more directly see what is actually the physics content of the theory. But there is also another very important application of the EFT paradigm. If we know, as we do know, that such effective field theories exist, then we can also use effective field theories if the fundamental theory is actually unknown. And then the effective field theory would describe any possible theory which contains a set of heavy particles which influences light physics and the power counting rules and the uh, most general Lagrangian of an EFT would give us the information what is the most general physics effect that any heavy particle can do and this information is obviously very valuable and it is also used for example to describe physics beyond the standard model because we do not know what kind of physics beyond the standard model exists. As long as it is heavy we know that we can describe it using such effective field theories. So uh, that is a small outlook why these effective field theories are actually useful. And so let us now come to a second section of our lecture, namely on loop calculations. And we will, of course, ultimately want to calculate loops in EFTs and, uh, for example, do this matching between fundamental and effective theories at the loop level. But uh, in this section, we will just learn about loops in general, not yet applied to effective field theories. And so um, I would be curious to get some information from you. What is your current level of knowledge and experience on loops? 
So um, at some point maybe I will ask you or you can give me some signs. But I will uh, definitely provide here a very brief practical introduction into loop calculations. So <clears throat> loop calculations and renormalization, which is necessary in order to give mathematical and physical meaning to the loop calculations. And uh, so we will be quite brief here. And on the exercise sheet, I will also uh, give you some uh, uh, references for other videos that you can watch. And obviously, this is standard topic that you see in every quantum field theory book. And there are some particularly recommendable ones which I put onto the exercise sheet. So let us begin with dimensional regularization. Since we want to be practical, let us introduce immediately the mathematical framework by which we will perform all loop calculations, namely the dimensional regularization, which is based on the idea that we replace four-dimensional integrals, like a four-dimensional loop integral d for k divided by 2 pi to the fourth by a d-dimensional version, d, d k divided by 2 pi to the power d times mu to the 4 minus d, where mu is an artificial mass scale which is introduced in order to uh, have a integration measure of the same dimensionality as the original one. So this is the idea. And uh, any divergent integral will become a function of d, which in general uh, exists, but maybe has poles for or singularities for certain values of d, like d going to 4 will become a pole. But otherwise, the integral will be well defined. And that is the uh, method of dimensional regularization. Um, who has seen this dimensional regularization before? That, okay, good. And then uh, let us uh, try to quickly summarize the main, um, let's say, calculational tricks that uh, we need. So uh, first about general integrals. Uh, let us begin with d-dimensional spherical coordinates. If you have uh, in Euclidean space, Euclidean space is denoted with a subscript E, a d-dimensional integral over some radially symmetric function, ke square. So vector square, which is Euclidean. That means this is simply a sum k1 square plus k2 square plus and so on up to kd square. Then in uh, polar coordinates, this becomes an integral over the d-dimensional um, unit sphere surface times a radial integral of a variable which runs from 0 to infinity, dk, k to the power d minus 1 times the function f of k square, where k is now simply the radial variable. So this is general spherical coordinates. And uh, in explicit uh, two dimension, three dimension, you know what that is here. Uh, but in general, this is just some um, parametrization of the d-dimensional surface of a unit sphere. OK, uh, so this is a general uh, relationship. Now let us um, introduce some mathematics, namely the gamma function. The gamma function is one of the most interesting uh, functions in mathematics. Let us give the definition. Gamma of a complex variable c is given by an integral 0 to 1 over t, t to the power z minus 1 times e to the minus t. So it's a generalization of an exponential 
integral. And it turns out that this is a meromorphic function. That means it is holomorphic, so it has a complex derivative, but it has poles at uh, the variable z equal zero, minus one, minus two, and so on, at the negative integers. And it is mathematically very rich and studied to great extent. And it is a generalization of the factorial. z times gamma of z is equal to gamma of z plus one. Gamma of one is one, and therefore you can conclude that gamma of n is equal to n minus one factorial for n a natural number. So it generalizes the factorial function to uh, the complex domain, and basically it interpolates between um, the factorials and it is extended to a complex variable over the entire complex plane, and you see that you can generalize it such that it is everywhere differentiable, even for complex values of its argument and also for negative values of the argument, except for these simple poles. And what is important for us is also a Taylor expansion, gamma of one plus epsilon, so gamma of one is one, and gamma of epsilon uh, one plus epsilon, it has a negative derivative, and uh, so you can write it as one plus epsilon times gamma prime of one plus higher orders, and the derivative is negative, and it has a name, uh, minus gamma e, the so-called Euler-Mascaroni constant. which is an irrational number, approximately one half. So this is the gamma function, and it is very useful also for us. Um, let us also introduce a relative, namely the beta function. So the beta function is a function of two arguments, beta of A and B. And it can be defined by two different integrals. And let me actually give the uh, maybe not so well-known definition, which could also be uh, set as a theorem, but let's use it as a definition zero to infinity integral dt, t to the a minus one divided by one plus t to the power a plus b. So you see that the beta function is defined as the result of an integral if you have here a rational function, so, um, um, or let's say a, a t to some power in uh, one factor and one plus t in another factor. So and there are many functions which by substitution can be reduced to something like this and the result is uh, obviously not simple but it is defined to be the beta function. And uh, the simple theorem is that the beta function is related to the gamma function like this. Gamma A times gamma B divided by gamma A plus B. That is elementary to prove by using the integral definition and some substitutions. So then we have collected some mathematical definitions. Um, another one is the Gauss integral. So let's say integral minus infinity to plus infinity over some one dimensional variable x, e to the minus x square. This is the Gauss integral. And the result is known. Who knows what the result is? Probably, yes. Uh, is it not square root of pi, simply? I guess yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so if you integrate from zero to infinity, then it would be square root of pi over two. Okay, uh, so this is known. Let us raise it to the power d and see what happens. If we raise it to the power of d, then one thing that we know is, uh, by virtue of your statement, the result is pi to the power d over two. 
But uh, on the other hand, we can now uh, write this as a product of d factors of the same integral. If it's the product of d factors of the same integral, it is nothing but a d-dimensional Gaussian integral. We can write it like this, a d-dimensional integral over d x coordinates uh, times e to the minus x vector square, where this is now a d-dimensional x vector. Then we basically have a product of d times the same integral, which is the Gaussian <coughs> integral. So and this would be d-dimensional Euclidean metric. Uh, and because of that, it is the same. But if we have that, then we can now use polar coordinates. Polar coordinates uh, mean that we write this as an integral over the d-dimensional the polar uh, angle factor times a one-dimensional integral from zero to infinity over one remaining variable dx. And uh, then we get x to the power d minus one times e to the minus x square, where we just have the single Gaussian integral again. Okay. So you see that you can relate a product of many Gauss integrals to basically a slight modification of one Gauss integral times the polar factor. And uh, then we can calculate this and uh, we know that and so we get the result for the polar factor, which is important. But this is not exactly the Gaussian integral, but it can be related to the gamma function. By using a substitution like x square becomes x, that becomes the definition of the gamma function. Okay. And uh, since we want to be practical, let's not uh, work out all the details. It is clear that by doing this substitution, you can bring it into this form. You get some prefactors. So, and uh, let me just give the result. After substitution, you get the gamma function. And the result um, is something which means that you get uh, this here, you can solve for that. And uh, let's give it a name. This is simply omega d, the surface of a d-dimensional unit sphere. And it is 2 pi times pi to the power d minus uh, d over 2 divided by gamma function of d over 2. And so here you see the pi to the power d minus 2, which comes from here. And here you see the gamma function with the argument d over 2 which comes from the substitution, x square becomes x. That means the exponent becomes basically x to the power d over two. And therefore, you get as a result gamma of d over two. So working through it gives you exactly this. And that means we have calculated in arbitrary dimensions the surface of a d-dimensional unit sphere. You can check it for two dimensions. What is the... Uh, surface of a two-dimensional unit sphere. What is a two-dimensional unit sphere? It would be a circle. What is the circumference of a circle? Two pi. Two pi. And so let's plug it in. D equal two. Then we get two pi divided by gamma of one is two pi. So it works. You can also check it for three dimensions. Uh, then pi to the power 3 over 2 divided by gamma of 3 over 2. And uh, then you must know what is gamma of 3 over 2. Or you actually, you can also turn it around and uh, calculate gamma of 3 over 2 by knowing that the uh, um, uh, three-dimensional sphere has surface 4 pi. So from this knowledge, you can calculate that gamma of 3 over 2 is something like square root of pi and so on. So uh, we have these results. That is important. And uh, obviously, you see now that uh, the, uh, it works for two dimensions, for three dimensions. But the mathematical formula is valid for any complex dimension. So we can say that this is now valid by definition, valid for all the uh, which are complex numbers. And there are just some small exceptions where uh, the gamma function or the denominator has poles. Yep. Um, I think in your definition of the gamma function, the upper limit of the integral is infinity. 
Um, I think that's right. Thanks. Yes. Sorry about this. Okay, um, another point. Any questions uh, otherwise? So let's um, give a final integral. Namely, um, using these definitions, we can uh, do something very useful. Very often in quantum field theory, there appear indeed radial integrals over some uh, variable k, which comes from uh, going to spherical coordinates. But the radial functions that we encounter come from uh, Feynman diagrams, and uh, the integrands are therefore elements of Feynman diagrams like propagators. Propagators look like 1 over k square minus m square. So we would like to be able to integrate things like 1 over k square minus m square. And uh, therefore, let us look at the following integral from 0 to infinity over one variable dk, k to the power d minus 1 divided by k square plus q to some power, let's call it nu, some complex power maybe. And then you see this is a generalization of such a propagator, k square minus m square, just k square plus some q raised to an arbitrary complex power and uh, k to the d minus 1 because we anticipate such a factor from going to spherical coordinates. So obviously it would be nice if we would have at our disposal just a result for this integral. And uh, what is this integral? What is the result? How can we compute it? The beta function, exactly. So by using some clever substitution, we uh, can replace k square by some variable t. And uh, by another substitution, we can normalize and make q equal to 1 by factoring out some dimension a full prefactor. And then it's the beta function, and therefore the result is known. Let's just write it down. By some substitution, it becomes the beta function. And uh, then working out the prefactors gives one half times q to the power d over 2 minus nu times the beta function with these arguments gamma of d over 2 times gamma of nu minus d over 2 divided by gamma of nu. So, and that is also a very important result that we will surely use later on. And so what is always good to see as a physicist, uh, things like this, prefactor q to the d over 2 minus nu, you can always get this by just looking at the units. The left-hand side has some units. The only dimensionful parameter is q. Therefore, you immediately know to what power q has to appear on the right-hand side. And that is exactly the power that emerges from the substitutions. It is always like this. And the rest is just a dimensionless numerical prefactor coming from mathematical integrations. And again, here the result is valid for any complex dimension, any complex exponent nu, and also for any complex uh, variable q here. But of course, for certain values, there might be singularities. That is clear. But in general, it is well defined for all um, numbers here. So the new element C. So this is a collection of useful integrals, their definitions and also how they can be uh, combined. Any questions? So uh, have you, uh, who has seen these formulas and used these formulas before? So, yeah. Okay. Yes. In principle, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, again, there will be singularities and maybe not only poles, but also things like branch cuts. If you have negative Q raised to some power, 
like zero to the power zero uh, is a singularity which is different from just the pole, but in general it is uh, obviously defined for any complex Q. So not for any complex Q, but uh, for almost every complex Q. Other questions? So let's go on, progressing towards calculating actual um, quantum field theory integrals. Something which is important is the weak rotation. So let us consider a typical quantum field theory integral, which is a d-dimensional momentum integral divided by k square minus q plus i epsilon with a positive small epsilon so that we have a positive imaginary part raised to some power nu again. Then we have Minkowski metric at first. So here k square is uh, given by k0 square minus k vector square um, because of Minkowski metric. And therefore, uh, we cannot immediately apply the integration tricks from before, but we have to treat separately the energy integral. So the integral over k0 takes a special role and it undergoes a weak rotation and afterwards uh, it becomes equal to the spatial integrals. So let us look at this. So let's look at the k0 integrand or uh, the k0 integral. Um, expanding uh, the scalar product, we get a quadratic function of the energy k0 square, so the bracket becomes k0 square minus something else, and the something else is actually in general complex because of the plus i epsilon. So the question is, when does the denominator become zero? It becomes zero if k0 square is equal to the rest, and uh, k0 square appears, therefore we have two solutions, either plus one solution or minus the same solution. So it has poles at k0 square equal to k vector square plus q minus i epsilon. And so let us draw it in the complex plane where we have the real part of k0 and the imaginary part of k0. The energy is real, of course, but we interpret it as a complex variable. And uh, then in this complex plane, let us assume that q is now positive. Then we know definitely k square is also positive. The vector k square is positive. q is positive by assumption. So we have here something real and positive minus a small imaginary part. Therefore, um, the number in the complex plane lies somewhere here. Positive real part and very small negative imaginary part. And so uh, k0 square must be this. That means one solution is also k0 is equal to the square root of that, which is again a number in the complex plane with positive real part and very small negative imaginary part. And the other solution is exactly the negative of it. So it lies around here in the complex plane. These are the two poles. Then our integration contour that we need to calculate is um, over the real axis. K0 runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. So drawing it in the complex plane means that we integrate along this contour. So this is the integration contour. So let's call it contour one. But now we can do the famous trick of the Wick rotation. Namely, we do not go to infinity uh, at the beginning, but let us just go very far out and then do a 
quarter circle here like that. Go here and then we go along the imaginary axis and then again such a quarter circle like this. And then we have, uh, okay, let's draw the arrow in the opposite direction, that we have now a closed contour in the complex plane, namely a very large part of the real axis, quarter circle, very large part of the imaginary axis, quarter circle, and then the contour is closed. Here we have some radius of the quarter circle, here another radius of the quarter circle, and if we go to infinity, then the radius of the quarter circle goes to infinity. This contour becomes the integration contour that we want, and that becomes the imaginary axis. So this is our contour two, the imaginary axis. Now the point is, uh, because of the residue theorem in the complex plane, we know that if you have a meromorphic, uh, sorry, um, or holomorphic function, or a meromorphic, then, uh, and this is an integer, um, or no, that doesn't have to be an integer, it only has to be holomorphic function surrounded by a contour, then the integral collapses to uh, the residues of the poles which are inside of the contour but the contour is chosen in such a way that no pole is inside the contour. Therefore, the residue theorem tells us that the integral over the entire orange contour vanishes. So that means the sum of the four integrals, this integral plus that integral plus the two quarter circles, that vanishes. At the same time, if the uh, quarter circle is very big, then we have here something everywhere in the quarter circle, which is suppressed by the big radius of the semicircle, uh, of the quarter circle. And if the index nu here is big enough, that suppresses the integral so much <coughs> that even though the length of the circle goes to infinity, the suppression is bigger, and therefore the contribution of the quarter circles vanishes at infinite radius. And then we are left with saying that the integral over contour one plus the integral over contour two is zero. And that means we can replace the integral over the real axis by an integral over the imaginary axis. That is the outcome of the analysis. So let's write it down. So the residue theorem tells us that the integral over contour one with the same integral um, plus the integral over contour two goes to zero for radius going to uh, infinity if nu is big enough. Okay, then we can simply say the integral over minus infinity to plus infinity of our variable k0 with the integrand is now the same as the integral, so the contour goes from top to bottom. So if we bring it to the other side, we get minus i times infinity to plus i infinity of dk0. So we can integrate over the imaginary axis uh, without changing the result. And now we can do a variable substitution where we replace k0 times i by a new variable ke. Let's call it ke, d to make it consistent. And um, then we get here i uh, times the integral of minus infinity to plus infinity um, actually. d k e comma d with the same uh, integrand. Uh, let's check the sign. Uh, I k zero. Yeah. Maybe I think I let's. Uh, so here the sign is correct because we integrate now from top to bottom instead of bottom to top, 
uh, before the sum was zero and now we uh, bring it to the other side and then we get this. Uh, let us use this uh, relationship and then I think it is correct. So anyway, this is the weak rotation where we say I Ke, D is equal to K0 and we also do for other variables Ke, I is equal to the original K, I and then we replace our Minkowski scalar product K square by minus K E comma D square minus K E comma I square and so now we have simply minus K E vector square we replace our Minkowski K square by the negative of a d-dimensional Euclidean vector squared. And so then our original integral, we do not have to write it down, becomes simply an integral in d dimensions over some Euclidean vector. And in the denominator, we have this minus um, Ke square Euclidean scalar product minus Q plus, two, uh, plus I epsilon. And that is very useful because afterwards we can now apply our knowledge of d-dimensional integrals in Euclidean metric to uh, such quantum field theory integrals. That is why we do it. Okay, so let's clean the blackboard and then we can write down the results of some important quantum field theory integrals. Uh, one question, what yep. is New equal one cannot be big enough because then I think the denominator goes down like one over k square and the radius goes up like r. Um, and so if you integrate one over k square, you get one over k uh, times r. Um, so it, it uh, doesn't go to zero. So k, new equal one is not big enough. So then again, uh, we would apply such a rule for um, any value of new uh, and in a large domain it converges and is correct and uh, we I will say it later on ag again but in many of these relations uh, they have a domain of convergence and outside this domain of convergence it is still defined in the sense of complex analysis and we can define the result by analytical continuation and that is what we do. So we come now to a very important result, namely the one loop master formula. Which is basically the integral formula that you can use to calculate all one loop integrals in relativistic quantum field theory. And, uh, we will also apply it in several cases. So let's define an abbreviation i for integral of mu to the power 4 minus d times a d-dimensional integral d dk divided by 2 pi to the power d. And then as an integral I use as a convention minus 1 to the power n, n minus 1 factorial divided by this denominator k square minus q plus i epsilon to the power n. And this here is again Minkowski space. And so then you see that this is, uh, as before, um, an integral that you could get from propagators in Feynman diagrams with uh, momentum in the denominator and some generalized mass and the plus i epsilon is the one we also have in relativistic propagators. Here a d-dimensional generalization of an integral that we would appear in loops and we have this integration measure um, that is the key idea of dimensional regularization. So and let me also introduce an abbreviation. So for this combination here I will simply use integral subscript k 
as a d-dimensional integration measure of a loop momentum. Okay, so how can we calculate it? Three simple steps now. The first step is the wick rotation. We wick rotate, as we just explained, and replace the Minkowski k squared by a Euclidean k squared. And I think you have done this, therefore I will not write down all the intermediate steps except for sketching which steps there are. So we do a wick rotation, then we get basically i times a d-dimensional Euclidean integral over some factors like minus 1 to the n divided by minus ke square minus q plus i epsilon to the power n and then you see that uh, minus 1 to the power n uh, cancels the minus in the denominator and we simply get plus k square plus q minus i epsilon in the denominator. And let us assume that this is definitely smaller than zero, which is equivalent to saying that q is a positive variable. And later on we will generalize by analytic continuation. Okay, so then we have exactly an integral of the type we had before, namely it's a radially symmetric Euclidean integral in d dimensions. So we use spherical coordinates and uh, we know what is the d dimensional unit sphere surface. Uh, we have it as a factor in the result and then what remains is a one dimensional radial integral which will give a beta function. So these are the steps. We do spherical um, coordinates and the radial integral gives a beta function. And therefore we can directly write down the result. Namely the result is i is equal to i times mu to the power 4 minus d times the variable q to the power d over 2 minus n times 4 pi to the power uh, sorry, minus d over 2 gamma function of d minus uh, n minus d over 2. And so what has happened here? The i prefactor, where does it come from? Let's discuss the result a little bit. Where does the i come from? From the weak rotation. Where does the q to this power come from? From the d dimensional surface. No, it does not. So it comes instead from, from the radial integral where we did the substitution. We had a radial integral k square plus q in the denominator, then we did the substitution and obtained exactly this prefactor. And again, the uh, exponent can be obtained just from looking at the units of the result, because it is the only thing that is dimensionful. So it must have this exponent because of the unit of the initial definition. And then uh, the gamma function comes from the surface integral. But um, there were some other functions also in the surface integral and the beta function and uh, there is some cancellation between the two. So in one case we had three gamma functions in the result. One is cancelled by the normalization here which is gamma of n and another one is cancelled between the radial integral and the surface integral. And therefore we have only one gamma function in the result and uh, also from the two pi um, from the surface integral combined with a radial integral, we get this 4 pi to the power. Okay, so this is the result and we can write it in a different way, namely by setting the dimension d equal to 4 minus 2 epsilon, which is often done. And please note that I use two epsilons, this epsilon for the dimension and that epsilon for the plus i epsilon prescription. They are not the same. So if we plug this in, then we get the following. I is now something and uh, I write the result now in a way where I first write down everything I would get just by setting d equal to 4 exactly. 
if I set d equal to 4 exactly, I get i divided by 16 pi square, namely here 4 pi to the power minus 2, okay? That is i over 16 pi square, then q to the power 2 minus n, 2 minus n, and then I write down everything which comes from the mismatch minus 2 epsilon in the dimension, so we get 4 pi to the power epsilon from here, then we get mu square divided by q overall to the power epsilon. So here that is mu to the epsilon and here the mismatch also gives you epsilon. And the gamma function of the argument n minus 2 plus epsilon. Yes. That is a very useful way to write the formula since it separates the four-dimensional uh, parts of the result from the part which directly depends on the regularization. And here from the epsilon dimensional part, there can arise these poles for d going to four. Okay, so uh, this is an important result. Let us discuss it. So some noteworthy points. First of all, the first factor here, i divided by 16 pi square, you see it arises directly from this master formula and it, the master formula is the general way you can write down every one loop diagram. Therefore, every one loop diagram will have this prefactor, one over 16 pi square, which is small. It is less than 1%. So there is a natural suppression of all one loop diagrams by a factor less than 1%. And also the i exists. So there is a typical one loop factor i divided by 16 pi square, which is small. Then, again, this q to the power 2 minus n, and also mu square divided by q to the power epsilon, all of this is just uh, clear from dimensional analysis. Okay. Looking at the units, you must get this result. Uh, mu square, by the way, is not part of the integral. Therefore, uh, that is just a prefactor which has been defined at the beginning and it will remain in the result forever and therefore uh, the remaining um, dimensionful quantity is Q and it must appear in this form. There is no other way. Therefore, you would not need a calculation in order to get these factors. So the only uh, non-trivial result from this complicated loop integration is basically uh, this mathematical stuff here, which is a mathematical formula of the order one. So typically these numbers that emerge from here are something like two, three, or maybe three factorial or something like that. So um, now comes this remark that we have already made, uh, the big rotation and the remaining integrals are correct for positive Q and n big enough. And if it happens to be a not positive or n is not big enough, then we define the result by analytic continuation. So then the same formula will again be valid um, but it is coming from analytical continuation, not from direct computation. So then, uh, what is interesting, obviously, is the gamma function in the result. It depends on epsilon, and it is the only thing which can diverge. Um, so we didn't stress it, but the whole thing is done because there are these divergencies in quantum field theoretical loop calculations. We have imposed a regularization, but for d going to four, the divergences are reappearing and they reappear in terms of poles of the gamma function 
if epsilon goes to zero. So one case, uh, the gamma function has poles at zero or at the negative integers. So when can it be zero? It can be zero if n is two. n equal two would give us gamma of epsilon. So it is definitely important to study gamma of epsilon. What is gamma of epsilon? We have already uh, learned about gamma of one plus epsilon, a Taylor expansion around one. And there is the recursion formula, namely epsilon times gamma of epsilon is gamma of one plus epsilon. So we can use it to say gamma of epsilon is gamma of one plus epsilon divided by epsilon. And so knowing this, we can plug in the Taylor expansion that we have from before. And then we get one over epsilon minus the euler mascaroni constant plus terms of order epsilon. And then you see that gamma of epsilon has a single pole, one over epsilon pole with residue one, as simple as that. One over epsilon, there is a finite remainder and terms of order epsilon. And uh, similarly, another case, n equal one might also be interesting. Um, then we get gamma of epsilon minus one and that can be obtained by using again the recursion formula that is gamma of epsilon divided by epsilon minus one. Um, and uh, okay, epsilon minus one for epsilon equals zero does not diverge, it becomes minus one. So, but we should do an expansion. And so if we Taylor expand this, then we get uh, minus gamma of epsilon minus one plus terms of order epsilon. Okay, and then you can plug in this also for uh, gamma of epsilon. So gamma of epsilon minus one also has a pole and uh, it is again a single pole, not one over epsilon square, but uh, again just one over epsilon, but with a coefficient minus one. So that is essentially minus one over epsilon plus uh, finite terms. Okay. And you could study in this way, uh, if it was, would be a mathematical exercise sheet, then we would now study all the poles, gamma of minus two, gamma of minus three, and so on, and you would discover that you always have a single pole, um, one over epsilon times a numerical coefficient which is certainly related to the uh, factorial function. But let's not do this. Let us look at the poles in a, a more physical way. So we definitely need to study the poles for d going to four, or equivalently for epsilon going to zero. And we know uh, that there are these poles if uh, n is either one or n is two. In these two cases, uh, the gamma function becomes either this or that, and in both cases, we have a one over epsilon pole plus finite terms. And let us now investigate what happens to the uh, expression over there in such a case. Uh, namely, since in both cases, the pole is essentially one over epsilon, either plus or minus one over epsilon, we can study what happens to the expression if you just replace the gamma function by one over epsilon. And then in the epsilon dependent terms, there emerges something very typical. You get a combination of factors, which I would say is a pole term. So you get four pi to the power epsilon times this dimensionful quantity mu square over q to the power epsilon times gamma of epsilon. This is what always emerges. And um, you can do a Taylor expansion of the first factors. So that should be viewed as exponential of epsilon times ln four pi and so on. And then you can do a Taylor expansion. You get one plus epsilon times ln four pi. And here also plus epsilon times ln mu square over q plus higher orders in epsilon. 
and gamma is uh, 1 over epsilon minus the euler mascheroni constant plus higher order terms. And if we combine it, we get on the one hand the 1 times 1 over epsilon gives 1 over epsilon, the pole. But then, in addition, we get finite terms which have a characteristic co combination, namely 1 over epsilon times the epsilon dependent terms gives ln 4 pi, and here plus ln mu square over q. But then we also have minus Euler Mascheroni constant times 1. So let's put it here, minus gamma e. And then higher order terms. <coughs> and now you see by construction, always the same combination of factors will appear whenever you have a divergent one loop integral. So even here, in this case, uh, the main thing which appears is gamma of epsilon. So you can reduce every divergence of every one loop integral to exactly this combination of factors, and you will always get this result. And therefore, you see that by construction, the one over epsilon pole is accompanied by some irrational numbers, ln 4 pi and euler mascheroni constant, which is always um, a linear additional term coming together with one over epsilon. And there is a more physical logarithm, which always also appears together with one over epsilon, a physical log of the uh, unphysical mass scale mu and the physical mass scale q, which is really the argument of the whole loop integration. So this is the only physical quantity the result will depend on. And it appears here in a logarithm. So, um, and often, this is abbreviated as capital delta. This is a typical divergent combination. And this ln mu square over q, so you have here a dimensionless argument in the logarithm as it has to be, a physical part and an unphysical part. And uh, what is the coefficient of the log? It is the same as the coefficient as 1 over epsilon. And that comes out by construction. Therefore, in every one loop Feynman diagram ever, uh, this log will have the same coefficient as the 1 over epsilon. So you can rely on this, and this is very important. So this has the same coefficient as the one over epsilon. Good, so that is an important analysis of one loop structures of one loop Feynman diagrams. And uh, we will then uh, in our calculation reduce um, any one loop diagram to the master formula. So by some algebraic manipulations any one loop diagram will be brought into this form and then we can read off the result of the integration by this and we know the divergence has this structure. Um, and of course, there are some non-divergent terms as well which are important because after renormalization the divergences will cancel, they are unphysical, um, but the finite remainder uh, should not cancel. That is the physical result of the loop integral. Any questions to this? Any surprises? Can we say for this one loop case that m is equal to the number of external particles? It will be like this in many cases. So if you have n propagators, then uh, n will be the number of propagators, which is also the same as the number of external lines typically. Yes. Any other questions? It is my choice for defining the master formula. You could uh, also put it onto the right-hand side of the equation. So, yeah, but I found it easier to put it onto the left-hand side of the definition. Otherwise, uh, so if you remove it, you will have one over n minus one factorial in the result.
the result is then dimensionless. In four dimensions, you would have a dimensionless integral, and uh, therefore it cannot depend on the dimension full variable. It will be a pure number. However, it is not a pure number since it is divergent, and uh, the, the, we need the regularization, and then the Q appears in terms of this logarithm together with the one over epsilon. And it will be an important physics question whether this is actually a physical result or an unphysical artifact of the regularization. And the answer is this is an important physical result. That is really a prediction of quantum field theory that uh, these uh, logarithms um, appear in the physics answer of um, um, physical questions even though the logarithm depends on the unphysical mass scale mu. But nevertheless, this is part of the physical answers of problems. And um, yeah, we will come to this and discuss it in way more detail because this is also important for effective field theory and also for renormalization group techniques, which is the other big topic we will discuss in this semester. Let me now make very few um, basic remarks on dimensional regularization. So the key names are of course Toft and Feldman who have invented and popularized the scheme uh, further important names are Breitenlohner and Meison, who have written very mathematical papers on dimensional regularization. Similarly, there is a very important book by John Collins. The name is Renormalization. And there are many original and very important results in the book. And uh, we have done a review uh, where we also summarized a lot of all this, which uh, you can find in the archive under this number. So the remarks I simply want to make right now is that uh, you can generalize the master formula. And uh, in this way, you can define uh, the dimensional multi loop integrals as well. And in this way, you obtain a regularization scheme which can be applied to every quantum field theory integral in arbitrarily high loop orders. So you can regularize every Feynman diagram that can appear. Um, and uh, the one loop version is this one. There are important properties that you can also use in calculations. Uh, the integral defined in this way, the d dimensional integral is linear. It is translationally invariant. So linearity means integral over two functions or sum of two functions is the sum of the integrals. I will not write it down. Translational invariance simply means this. Uh, integral over f of k is the same as the integral if you shift the integration momentum by a constant, say p. So you replace k by k plus p in the argument of the integrand. And the result is always going to be the same. So uh, that is equivalent to saying that um, integrals over total derivatives vanish or surface integrals are always zero in dimensional regularization. There are some more properties, but let me write down just one. Derivatives commute with the integral. That means if you have a derivative with respect to some momentum p, of an integral uh, where the integrand f depends on k and the momentum p separately 
and you take the integral over k and afterwards do a derivative with respect to p, then you can commute and first do the derivative with respect to p and afterwards do the integral. So that is a general result that this is always true in dimensional regularization. And that is obviously also useful in practical calculations. Then another important property is very simply put. So there is a very uh, elaborate theory of renormalization going on in the background. And let me just say that dimensional regularization is one of the possible regularizations which is mathematically consistent with all basic properties of renormalized quantum field theory um, to make or to generate a finite uh, physically meaningful quantum field theory at the end. So it is one of the possible regularizations consistent with basic quantum field theory postulates such as unitarity causality, and so on. You can also and have to uh, generalize algebraic objects. Such as, for example, gamma matrices are then simply interpreted in d dimensions or also vector fields a mu of x like the photon field. Here in all these cases the index mu is interpreted as a d-dimensional Lorentz index which runs from 0 to d minus 1 and otherwise has the usual properties. Similarly metric tensor is interpreted in d dimensions where uh, mathematical relationship is then contraction g mu nu upstairs, g mu nu downstairs gives you the number of dimensions and uh, that is now simply d, 4 minus 2 epsilon instead of 4. So there is uh, really many advantages come with this uh, simple scheme to translate everything into d dimensions because essentially nothing changes between explicit four dimensions and general arbitrary d dimensions except for one thing, namely gamma 5. So there is a problem for gamma 5 which is defined as i times the product of explicitly for gamma matrices and uh, that has no easy or uh, extension to d dimensions or at least no extension to d dimension with simple properties. Any extension has somehow awkward or complicated uh, properties. But otherwise uh, there are many important advantages of dimensional regularization. It is very efficient. It allows uh, elaborate integration techniques. So it is the overwhelmingly used in practical calculations. And in particular, a uh, reason is that it preserves gauge invariance. At least in QED or QCD and so on, where gamma 5 plays no role. Okay, so the outcome of this uh, small set of remarks should simply be that you are aware that there are a few things that one should uh, make sure in order to use dimensional uh, regularization with good conscience, 
but uh, people have made sure that it can be used and uh, I can give you references and so on. But let's not do this here in this lecture. But in this lecture we rely on the results, namely dimensional regularization is the best regularization and is practically always used. And also for effective field theory discussions, it has specific advantages, which I cannot list right now, since they are not really understandable at this point. But it is extremely efficient also for setting up effective field theories. Let us define a few simple loop integrals. And let me give you some definitions and notations. So at the one loop level, there appears a class of diagrams. Uh, the simplest one loop diagram would be this one where we have one propagator and the integral would then look like this mu to the power 4 minus d times a d-dimensional integral over k to pi to the power k and the integrand is 1 divided by k square minus m square plus i epsilon. That would be one ordinary propagator Feynman rule, no vertex rule that would be just a numerical factor and uh, so this is a standard integral corresponding to such a Feynman diagram and uh, we just give it a name at this point. Let us call it by definition i over 16 pi square times a0 of m. a0 is the name of the function uh, which is defined as the result of this integral. And uh, I pulled out the one loop factor which always appears i over 16 pi square such that the a0 is a function which contains numbers like 1 or 2 and so on. It's of the order 1. Let us go on with our set of definitions. The next would be such a Feynman diagram with two vertices and two propagators. One momentum p is incoming and then let's say here in this line we have a mass m1 and uh, in that line we have a mass m2 and then we have a loop momentum k running in the loop like this and here the momentum p plus k runs in this propagator. Then at every vertex momentum is conserved and we have a loop momentum k. The integral would be mu to the 4 minus d d dk over uh, 2 pi to the power d. And then we have now two propagators, namely k square minus m1 square times k plus p square minus m2 square, and I'm suppressing the i epsilon here, but it also appears. And the result is simply defined as b0, i over 16 pi square times b0. And the b0 function is defined as the result of the integral. And what does it depend on? It depends on three physical quantities, namely on the external momentum p and on the two masses m1, m2. So it is a function of three variables and uh, um, defined like this. By the way, the first integral is directly equal to the master formula. The integral is exactly of the form of the master formula, so I could write down the result immediately. The second one is not. So here we will have to do some additional calculation before we can apply the master formula, but we will be able to do it. And so on. So without any further formulas, you could define this as a C0 function with some arguments, this as D0 function with some arguments and uh, so on. Obviously, you can extend this and uh, you have an automatic scheme to give name to any uh, integral uh, of these kinds, okay? Yeah. What does this index zero stand for? 
Yes, that comes now. Namely, there are also integrals that look like this. So an integral over k with this measure. And let's say in the denominator, we again have k square minus m1 square times k plus p square minus m2 square. But now in the numerator, we have something. We do not have one, but instead we have, for example, k mu. The loop momentum appears in the numerator. Then the result is defined to be i divided by 16 pi square <coughs> times b mu of p m1 m2. Okay. And similarly, there is also a naming scheme. So I could write here, let's say, maybe in such brackets, I could also have a numerator k mu k nu or a higher polynomial in the case. So k mu k nu. If k mu k nu appears, then I would call it b mu nu. Okay. So I hope the notation is understandable. So it's either this, then the result is called b mu, or it's that, then the result is called b mu nu. The point is, you have a naming scheme. So for any integral which has an arbitrary number of ordinary propagators and an arbitrary um, polynomial in K in the numerator, you have now a scheme to define the name of the result. And um, that is useful in order to uh, have some simple way of imagining what we are dealing with. But of course, we have not calculated it yet. And let us now come to the calculation. So the calculation of all of these integrals can be done in the same way, so uh, of those ones here without numerator. Let us first do the ones without numerator because that is also what you need in the exercise. And the key trick in order to evaluate the integrals with um, several propagators in the denominator is what is called Feynman parametrization or equivalently Schwinger parametrization. We work here with Feynman parametrization, which is a little bit simpler, maybe a little bit less general, but anyway. So, and uh, the ingenious trick is simply to write a product, one over A times B, as an integral 0 to 1 dx, 1 divided by a times x plus b times 1 minus x, overall squared. Okay. So that is a typical Feynman invention, but I think it was also invented by Schwinger. But um, anyway, you can work out in an elementary way the integral uh, over x, and you discover that the result is simply 1 over a times b. So, of course, it looks like you make something simple, extremely complicated, but the point is now you have one denominator raised to some power, which is what we know in our master formula. And so that is the trick that you should apply to all those integrals here. You can generalize it. Let me give you the explicit result for three. So you can write it like this, one, zero to one dx, and then zero to x dy, then you have two in the numerator and in the denominator you have a times y plus b times x minus y plus c times one minus x raised to the third power. Okay. And again, it's elementary to check it. And, and the point is, instead of three factors, you have one factor raised to the third power such that our master formula can be applied, and so on. So I invite you to check for yourself in the literature. Uh, there are generalizations of this. If you have arbitrarily many uh, factors here, and you can even have the factors raised to some powers like a square, b cube, c to the fourth power, then there is still such a generalization of these Feynman parameters. We will not need all of them, but therefore, let's just use those two here. And uh, you can apply it. 
to calculate those scalar integrals and let's apply it for the B0 function. For the B0 function, we have now the following. One over these two uh, factors, k squared minus m1 squared times k plus p squared minus m2 squared. So this is one over a times b. And uh, we write it using Feynman parameters as an integral 0 to 1 dx. And then simply 1 divided by the square bracket overall squared. And what is in the square bracket? In the square bracket, we have the first factor times x. So this times x plus the other factor times 1 minus x. k plus p square minus m2 square times 1 minus x. OK. So that looks complicated, but now uh, comes something which always works. So what is actually the square bracket? The square bracket, let's work it out. Uh, and working out means that we write it as a polynomial in k, which is our integration variable. So where does k appear? k square, and here some polynomial in k. Let's first look at the k square terms. What are the k square terms in the square bracket. So here we have k square times x, and here we have overall k square times 1 minus x. So in total, we get just k square times 1. And that always appears like this. So it's always like that, that uh, the k square term gets coefficient 1 in the Feynman parametrization, which is one of the ingenious properties of the whole scheme. So we just have k square. But then we have a linear term, k. Where is a linear term? Here, we have k plus p square gives 2kp times 1 minus x. Uh, maybe let's swap it. Let's do it like this. That times x and this times 1 minus x. So this will become a little bit simpler. So uh, then, anyway, 2kp times x. So we have 2x. Two, two times pk. And then uh, the k independent terms is the rest. So what is the rest? We have here plus p square times x uh, minus m1 square times 1 minus x minus m2 square times x. Okay. And now our master formula contains just k square. Here we do not have just k square. We almost have uh, only k square, but also a linear term. And we can now do completing the square by redefining a variable. So the strategy is always complete the square. So and here we can define k prime is equal to k plus x times p. Okay. Then. Uh, these two terms can be interpreted as k prime square is then k square plus 2x pk plus x square p square. Okay? And then you see that all the k dependent terms, they can be written as k prime square minus something constant. So therefore, the square bracket becomes k prime square, then minus x square p square from here, and then all the rest, plus p square x minus m1 square, 1 minus x minus m2 square times x. Okay. And then we have the form of our master formula. So this is now simply k square times a constant, which doesn't depend on k. And so uh, we can. Um, write this as, let's say, minus q. That is our q from before. And then our square bracket takes the form k prime square minus q. And therefore, we can compute the b0 function in terms of our master formula.
So then we leave the result i over 16 pi square times p0 with the three arguments p, m1, m2 is equal to the following. So the definition has become the integral over that, okay, but now uh, the integra integral is translationally invariant, so the integral over k and over k prime is the same. That is the same. Therefore, our integral formula applies also to the integral with k prime square minus q. And then the integrand is simply uh, 1 divided by k prime square minus q square overall. So in our master formula, n is equal to 2. Okay, and q is this. And then we can copy the result from the master formula. Um, so let's write it down completely. Maybe 1 dx uh, k prime integral 1 over k prime square minus q. And we can also reinstate the plus i epsilon square. And uh, where is the result? So p0 of p m1 m2 is equal to a one-dimensional integral from 0 to 1 dx. And I copy the result from the master formula for n equal 2. So we, all the first factors go away. 4 pi to the power epsilon mu square over q overall to the power epsilon times gamma of epsilon. Where I repeat, q here is equal to that formula. So we can, uh, it was negative, so let me write it in a positive way. m square times 1 minus x plus m2 square times x minus p square x times 1 minus x. And note, x is between 0 and 1. So 1 minus x is positive, x is positive, x times 1 minus x is positive. So I've written it deliberately in this way. So uh, then, that is our result. And we can now plug in the result for the gamma function that we have already seen. It gives a 1 over epsilon divergence, which combines with the epsilon dependent exponents to this typical divergent factor. So and let me also do a small discussion. Our time is up, but let's briefly say Q uh, had to be positive in order for the integrals to converge immediately without any problems. And when is Q positive? Q is positive if P square is negative. So not only, but uh, if P square is negative, then Q is definitely positive in the entire X range. And negative p square is possible because we are in Minkowski space. That just means that the spatial momentum is big and the energy is small. Typically, T-channel Feynman diagrams have negative p square. So that is a physically meaningful case. But um, um, q square negative is possible. Otherwise, and then uh, we need analytical continuation of logarithms, for example, by using the i epsilon prescription. So um, let me just uh, say a few more words and then uh, we are done. So the epsilon expansion can be used and then B0 simply becomes our divergent uh, combination, capital delta, coming from the gamma function, the 4 pi, and um, the euler mascaroni constant, and uh, then plus the logarithm of this, and then what remains is minus an integral over x from 0 to 1 ln q divided by mu square. So I flip the sign plus order epsilon. And here, 
then you can evaluate the integral by saying q is of the form a times x minus x1 <coughs> times x minus x2 because q is a quadratic function in x. So you can always write it like this, maybe with complex x1, x2. But then um, if you plug that back in, then you get integrals like ln of x minus xi, and that is elementary to integrate. So in principle, uh, you now know what to do, and it is definitely doable, so you will be able to derive an explicit result without a one-dimensional integral uh, as the result of such a B0 function. It's not always necessary to fully evaluate this, but at least it's nice to know that you can definitely do it if it is meaningful or if you want to know the final result. Then this is how you can get it. Okay, now one word to the exercise sheet. Uh, please do as much as you can until Wednesday. There are two exercises. One is on the photon vacuum polarization, and maybe you did this already in the past. If um, you did, then use it as a repetition and um, go through the calculation once again and uh, make sure that you understand in particular the expansions that are described at the end of the exercise and uh, as it is also written there, uh, this whole thing is fully on video in one of the older quantum field theory lectures, so you are welcome to watch this as well uh, while you are doing the exercise. The exercise number two is technically simpler than the photon vacuum polarization because on the second page you only have scalar integrals like these ones and you are just supposed to write down a lot of one loop diagrams in a full theory and in an effective theory, write down the integrals and evaluate them in terms of this just in order to familiarize yourself with uh, which kind of uh, functions appear in the result and uh, you are not yet required to fully evaluate the integrals on the second page of the sheet. And then we can discuss it on Wednesday. All right, so far so good. Then see you on Wednesday.